Greetings everyone, this is IQ Academy. Today we are revising physics paper two, which is the multiple choice. This paper is from February, March, 2023. We are going to go over all the 40 questions with detailed explanations. And please remember to subscribe to my channel. Number one, test our knowledge of scalar quantities and vector quantities. We know that scalar quantities are quantities which have magnitude only, whereas vector quantities have both magnitude and direction. Now, looking at the options given, which list has two scalar quantities and two vector quantities? We are going to find the answer by elimination. Here, distance is a scalar quantity, speed is a scalar quantity, time is a scalar quantity, and velocity is a vector quantity. This is not correct because we have three scalars and one vector. Force is a vector quantity, velocity is a vector, distance is a scalar, mass is a scalar. This is correct because it meets the requirements of the question two scalar quantities and two vector quantities. So our answer is B. Question number two says, the diagram shows the speed time graph for a car. Which row describes the motion of the car at point X and at point Y? To interpret the speed time graph properly, you need to understand the relationship between gradient and acceleration. If we look at point X, we have uniform positive gradient. So the acceleration or gradient is uniform and positive. This means the rate of change of speed is uniform and positive. Speed is increasing uniformly. That's what it means. Now, if we look at y, we can see that the gradient is zero. Now, if gradient is zero, it means there is no change of speed. There is no change of speed. So the speed is maintained. There is maintaining of speed. Now, using this information, let's answer our question. A says, at point X, the car is at rest. We can see that acceleration is positive, so speed is increasing uniformly. This is therefore not true. At Y, the object is moving with constant speed. If acceleration is zero, it means we are maintaining the speed. So the speed is constant, that's true. So this statement is true, but A is eliminated because of this statement. If we go to B, B says at X, the car is moving with constant speed, which is to say, the speed of the car at x is not changing. However, we have just seen that acceleration is positive, meaning the speed is changing uniformly in a positive way. It is increasing. So b is going to be eliminated because of this statement. It's also not at rest. Okay, let's look at C. The car is moving with changing speed. Acceleration is positive. It means the speed is increasing. So this point here is true. However, the car is not at rest. So C is eliminated. If we look at D, both options are true. The speed is changing a at x, which is true, and the speed is constant at y, which is true again. So our answer is D. Four objects are moving in a straight line. 
The table shows the distances moved by each object in each second of its motion. Which object is moving with a constant non-zero acceleration? Okay. Distance per second is speed. We know that speed is equal to distance over time. So the values we are looking at here, these are the speeds in each and every second given. So if we look at A, the speed in the first second is 5, second one is 5, third, fourth is still 5. This object is moving at constant speed zero acceleration so a is out the speed is not changing the acceleration is therefore zero if we look at b the speed here because distance per second is speed the speed is five the speed is going to six seven and eight so the speed is increasing there is some acceleration. How is the speed increasing? The speed is increasing by one in each and every second. The speed is increasing by one in each and every second. So the acceleration is uniform. The rate of increase of speed is uniform. So this is our answer here. Question number four is an interesting question. The drag force on a car increasing with speed. At 20 meters per second, the total drag force is 400 newtons. The mass of the car is 1,200 kgs and the driving force is constant at 700 newtons. Which statement about the acceleration of the car at 20 meters per second is correct? Okay. Let's start by calculating the acceleration. We know that from F is equal to M A, acceleration is therefore equal to F divided by M. Now, F is the resultant force. It's not just a force, but resultant force. Now, for this car, it is driving forward with a constant force of 700. And the drag force with its friction is 400 newtons at this particular speed. This means the result and force is equal to 300 newtons. Now, we can plug this value into this equation. So, A is equal to 300 newtons divided by 1200 and we get 0 0.25 meters per second squared. Okay, so our answer is between A and B. Now, will this acceleration increase or will it decrease? If the speed of the car increases, the drag force is going to increase as well. It's written in the question. So, if the drag force increases, like this value, if it increases, then it means the resultant force is going to decrease. When the resultant force decreases, acceleration 
will decrease. So our answer will be A. Question number five says, a rectangular swimming pool is 50 meters long and 25 meters wide. It contains water at a depth of two meters. The density of the water is given. What is the mass of the water in the pool? We know that density, sorry, density is equal to mass over volume. If we make them the subject of the formula, M is equal to density multiplied by volume. Now, the density is given as 1000 and the volume, we get volume from length times width times depth. So the length is 50, the width is 25, the depth is 2. This is going to give us, let's see, 1000 multiplied by 2,500,000 kgs. So our answer is D. Question number six says, an object is rising vertically at constant speed through water. There are three vertical forces acting on it. The weight, W, the drag force, D, and the upward force, U. We can see that if the object is rising at constant speed, then there is no resultant force acting on this object. That's something we need to take note of. Let's look at the options given. Option A has a problem. The object is moving upwards, but the drag is pointing upwards. The drag is the friction. It cannot point in the same direction as motion. Drag or friction must oppose the motion. So A is out. Let's look at B. Again, this drag is pointing in the direction of motion. So, because of that, we cannot take B. And again, there is a resultant force. The upward forces add up to 5 newtons. And the downward force is 1 newton. So there will be a resultant of 4. This is not acceptable because we are told that it's rising at constant speed. That is the same issue we face with C. There is a result and force of two newtons on C. So C is not accepted. And again, at C, we can see that the object is sinking. It's not rising. That's another problem. If we look at D, the upward force is pointing in the right direction. The drag and the weight are pointing in the right direction. There is no resultant force. The upward forces are adding up to 3 newtons. The downward forces are adding up to 3 newtons. So there is no resultant so we will get constant speed. Our answer is D. Okay, we go to question number seven. Two boys of equal weight sit on one side of a seesaw as shown. Their father of weight, 1000 Newton, sits on the other side. The seesaw is balanced and is being used 
so that it moves up and down. During one part of the cycle, the father descends through a distance of 40 centimeters and sorry, at the same time, the boy nearest the pivot rises through 20 centimeters, while the other boy rises through 80 centimeters. What is the weight of each boy? Okay, so the father has a weight of 1000 newtons. And he is 40 centimeters from the pivot. This boy has a weight less of x. And same with this boy, weight of x. The distance of the first boy from the pivot is given as 20 centimeters. And the distance of the other boy from the pivot is given as 80 centimeters. From the law of moments, this seesaw is balanced. So the anticlockwise moments from the father must balance the clockwise moments from these two boys. So the anti-clockwise moments here they are 40 multiplied by 1000 and they are equal to 20 multiplied by x plus 80 multiplied by x. So this is the moment due to this boy. This is the moment due to the weight of that boy. So we have 40,000 equal to 100x. This gives us x is 400. So the weight of each boy is 400 newtons. Our answer is B. Question number 8 says, a student measures the length of a spring. She then attaches different weights to the spring. She measures the length of the spring for each weight. The table shows her results. What is the extension of the spring with a weight of 3 newtons attached to it? <clears throat> extension is equal to length minus original length. In this case, our length is the length when we attach a 3 newton weight. So that's 533. The original weight, sorry, the original length is the length when we do not have any weight attached to the spring. So this is 520. Doing our calculation, the extension will be 13 millimeters, giving us D is the correct answer. Let us look at question number nine. The momentum of a body is changed by a force acting on it for a period of time. Which action increases the change in momentum? To answer this question, we need to remember the equation for impulse, which says impulse is equal to change in momentum. Okay, now, if we want this change in momentum to increase, you have to increase the force 
you are applying and also the time so increasing these two values will increase the change in momentum which we can call delta p all right so let's look at the options and see which one is most appropriate we double the force good you have the time no you don't want to reduce the time we double the force good for the same time all right that's okay you reduce the force and the time this is not correct e, likewise this one is not correct as well you have the force and double the time okay doubling the time was good but halving the force is not good so b is the most appropriate here number 10 the equation used to find the change in gravitational potential energy of an object can be written as follows e is the change in gravitational potential energy and delta h is the change in height which row gives the quantities y and z you might have been given this equation as gpe gravitational potential energy is equal to m g h this is the same equation as this one so what is missing is the mass let's look at where we have mass we have mass here we have mass there the other options which do not mention mass are already out g is the gravitational field strength so this is still good this one falls away so our answer is a number 11 a machine has a power input of 200 watts and a useful output of energy of 1000 joules in six minutes what is the efficiency of the machine all right let's see how much energy is taken in by this machine in six minutes we know that energy is equal to power multiplied by time in this case that would be 200 multiplied by 6 multiplied by 60. let's see what we get from that 200 times 6 times 60. we get 7 72 000 joules so out of this energy supplied only one kilojoule 1000 joules will be converted to useful energy so the efficiency of this machine efficiency is equal to useful energy divided by the total supplied energy okay we'll multiply by 100 to get a percentage all right so that gives us 100 divided by that's 1.38 1.4 this is our correct answer number 12 what is the unit of power well we know the unit of power is the watt okay the volt is the unit of potential difference 
can also say it's the unit of EMF. Oh, it's okay. The neutron, this is the unit of force. And the Joule, this is the unit of energy. The number 13, the diagram shows a rectangular block of weight 16 newtons. It is resting on a flat surface. What is the pressure at the base of the block due to its weight? Okay. We need to identify the cross-sectional area of the base. The cross-sectional area in this case would be this is the cross-sectional area of the base so area is equal to 4 times 5 giving us 20 square centimeters we know that pressure is equal to force per unit area. The force is 16 newtons. The area is 20 square centimeters. So the pressure at the base, actually here, that is the base there. The pressure at the base would be 16 divided by 20. That gives us 0 0.8 newtons per centimeter squared. It's very important to look at your units. Question number 14 says, an oil tank has a base of area given and is filled with oil to the depth given. The density of the oil is given. What is the force exerted on the base of the tank due to the oil? All right, here we want to get the mass of the oil. Then we go on to get the weight of the oil. That weight is the force which the question is talking about. So to get the mass, we are going to use density is equal to mass over volume, meaning mass is equal to density multiplied by volume. This gives us 800 multiplied by 1.2 multiplied by 2.5. Well, this is volume because volume can also be given as area, cross sectional area multiplied by depth. So that is where this 1.2 multiplied by 2.5 becomes our volume. If we pass that in the calculator, we get. Two thousand four hundred. All right. So the mass of the fluid is two thousand four hundred kgs. If we change this to weight, then the weight of the fluid is equal to mass multiplied by gravity. So two thousand four hundred multiplied by 10. We are using 10 as our acceleration due to free fall. So the eventual answer would be 24,000 newtons. So our answer here is D. Number 15, 
A sample of gas is trapped in a rigid container. As the temperature of the gas is increased, the pressure increases. Which statement is not correct? We are going to use elimination to answer this question. A says the gas molecules have greater kinetic energy. Uh, this one is correct because when you heat a gas, the molecules are going to move faster and therefore they now have more kinetic energy. Let's look at B. The gas molecules heat the walls of the container harder. Again, this is correct. This is because when the gas molecules start to move faster and if they bump into anything, they are going to heat that thing with more force because they are moving faster. It's like a car that is moving slowly. If it bumps into you, you won't feel the pain. If it is moving very fast, if it bumps into you, you will feel the pain. So, fast moving gas molecules, they hit the walls of the container harder. Let's look at C. The gas molecules hit the walls of the container more frequently. This is correct. If we look at this as our container, a molecule which is moving slowly will take a long time to hit this wall and bounce back to hit that wall and repeat the process. So this molecule will be bumping into the walls of the container less frequently. Let's make this molecule a little bit faster. It now moves from here to here very quickly and bounces back very quickly. What this means is a fast moving molecule will hit the walls of the container more frequently. All right, let's go to D. The gas molecules move further apart. This statement is not correct. And this is the one we are looking for. Why is that so? You have heat or supplied energy. You have supplied heat or energy to these gas molecules. Now these gas molecules, they have energy to move away from each other. But the container which is holding these molecules is rigid. It is not expanding to suit the will of the gas molecules. So the molecules have energy, the molecules are ready to move further apart, but the container is restricting their motion or restricting their ability to move further apart. So the correct answer is C. The molecules remain close to each other because the container doesn't allow them to move further apart. Number 16 says, what happens when the temperature of a liquid increases? We are going to eliminate. The mass of the liquid increases, making the liquid less dense. This is not true because mass of a substance is the amount of matter in that substance. It is the number of atoms, is the number of molecules in that matter. Increasing temperature of a substance does not lead to a change of a number of atoms and stuff like that. So mass is a constant here. It doesn't change. This one is out. B is out because of the same reason. Let's look at C. The volume of the liquid increases. Well, we know that is true from the kinetic theory of matter. When you heat a substance, it expands, its volume increases. Now, does this increase in volume lead to an increase in density or a decrease in density? Let's look at an equation. Density is equal to mass over volume. If we look at this equation closely, we will see that when volume goes up, 
density will go down. Mass is a constant in this case. So C is correct. D is wrong because the liquid is not going to become more dense when its volume increases. We are going to choose C. Number 17 says, a bar of metal, which is a good conductor, a good thermal conductor, is heated at one end. What is the main method of transfer of thermal energy along the bar? All right. A says lattice vibration. This is just to distract you. It is not correct. B, the movement of atoms of the metal along the bar. Well, atoms are stuck in their lattices. They don't have the ability to move around that easily, especially when we are looking at a solid thermal conductor. So we are going to take this one out. C, transfer by electrons. We do know that there is a sea of electrons which moves around when one side of the of the thermal conductor is heated this sea of electrons these mobile electrons sometimes they're called delocalized electrons they are the ones which are responsible for transfer of heat in metals which are good thermal conductors a vibration of atoms of the metal bar this is not the main method. It's responsible, but it's not the main method. So we'll take it out. Our answer here is C. Number 18. A transverse wave moves along a rope. The diagram shows the position of the rope at one particular time. Which two labeled points are one wavelength apart? We usually say a wavelength is from crest to crest or from trough to the adjacent trough. That option is not given here. So we will look at the wavelength as the distance between two points, two adjacent points which are in phase. Two adjacent points which are in phase on this rope are point X and point Z. We consider them to be in phase because they are doing exactly the same things at the same time. So X and Z, that's our solution there. Number 19 says, light in a transparent plastic meets a boundary with air. Light is transmitted into the air only if the angle marked theta in the diagram is greater than 36 degrees. What this means is if the angle is less than 36 or equal to 36 degrees, we experience a phenomenon called total internal reflection. So to avoid Total internal reflection, the angle has to be greater than 36 degrees. We know that the relationship between total internal reflection and refractive index is as follows. The refractive index N is equal to 1 divided by sine C where C is the critical angle. Okay, now this diagram is not really showing us C. We need to draw the normal here. This is C. So right now, C is equal to 90 minus 36. If we substitute into this equation now, we have n is equal to 1 over sine 90 minus 36. 
this gives us 1.23 something something there so our answer is c number 20 in converging lens as a focal length f an object o is placed to the left of the lens as shown where is the image formed and how does its size compare to the object? We need to draw ray diagrams here. So let's get to that. We, sorry. Okay, a line that is parallel to the principal axis then from there that line passes through the focal point i can already see that the image would be on the same side as the object there is no space here so how do we get another line which can tell us where the image is going to be Okay, we start from, we can go in this direction, well, that's, that's not necessary. We can go in this direction and somewhere somewhere here, these two lines are going to converge. They are never going to converge here. They are already diverging the further we go in this direction. So our image would be approximately here. That's where the image would be. Okay. Now, among the options that we have, we can see that A, which says opposite. Is, or is incorrect b is incorrect we are saying the image is not on this side let's look at c and d on the same side of the lens as the object this is correct larger than the object we can clearly see from our diagram that's correct so c is looking good number 21 which diagram shows what happens when a ray of white light passes through a prism we are going to use the illumination here the ray gets in a the ray gets to the prism we expect refraction and dispersion the white light must be divided into its constituent red orange yellow blue indigo violet and so forth it's not happening here it's not happening so a is out sorry a is out in b let us draw the normal the ray of white light is moving from an optically less dense medium which is the a here and it's getting into the prism it should be refracted towards the normal here it's being refracted away from the normal this is a problem if we look at c Everything is good here, right here, right here, things are looking good. But when we get here, I don't even know what this light is doing now. It's even on the same side of the normal, the, the refracted ray and the incident ray are on the same side of the normal, the C is not correct. Therefore, our answer would be D. Number 22 says, a TV station transmits a signal to a television receiving dish. 
The TV has an indicator on off light. The TV is switched on by a remote control which changes the indicator light from red to green. Which electromagnetic wave used in these actions has the longest wavelength? Well, you need to know the waves which are indicated as A, B, C, and D. Here, for satellite communication, we are using microwaves. Here, for the remote control, we are using infrared rays. Then between C and D, this is the visible range. Red light is visible, green light is visible. Okay. So, between the microwaves, infrared, and visible, which one is the longest wavelength? Our answer would come out as A. We know that the longest wavelength of electromagnetic waves are the radio waves, followed by the microwaves, followed by the infrared, followed by the visible, followed by the X-rays, followed by the gamma rays. I left out the ultra. The ultraviolet rays there. So our answer is going to be A. Number 23 says, a student makes a list of some applications of waves. Which applications use ultrasound waves? Let's use elimination. Medical scanning of soft tissue, we actually have a medical procedure called ultrasound. So this one makes use of ultrasound. Sterilizing water, this one makes use of UV radiation. Using sonar to calculate ocean depth, this method again uses ultrasound. So C is the correct option here. Number 24 says, the diagram shows a bar magnet at rest on a smooth horizontal surface. A length of soft iron wire is held parallel to the magnet. The wire is released. What happens? We know that soft iron wire is attracted to the magnet. So when we release this wire, it should move towards the magnet. It is attracted. So A is wrong and B is correct. Number 25. Which diagram shows the electric field pattern and direction around a positive point charge? The field pattern around a point charge would be radial. So the correct answers between A and B. Now, if the charge is positive, then the field will be pointing outwards. This makes A radial and pointing outwards. That is our correct answer. What we see on B is for a negative charge, radial and pointing inwards. What we see on C and D, this is the field pattern around a current carrying conductor. All right, so our answer is A. Number 26. A laboratory has a standard wire of non resistance. It also has other wires made from the same material as the standard wire, but of different lengths and diameters. Which wire would definitely have a resistance 
of less than the standard wire. Okay. If a wire is long, then its resistance will be more. So these longer wires, they have more resistance. If a wire has a bigger diameter, then it will have less resistance. That is because, let's say we have this tunnel and this tunnel, and we ask you to crawl fast through these two tunnels. You will move very quickly through this one and this one. So the, the bigger the diameter, the easier it will be for you to crawl through. So larger diameters have less resistance. All right. Our answer would be short wire with a larger diameter. That is C. Number 27. The graph shows the relationship between the current in a circuit component and the potential difference across it. The graph has a straight section and a curved section. What happens to the resistance of the component in these two sections as the current increases? Well, in the straight section, let's just say up to here, we can see that the gradient is constant. Why are we talking about gradient? There's a relationship between resistance and gradient. We know that in this case, resistance is equal to V over I. And gradient is equal to I over V. In other words, resistance is equal to 1 over gradient. So if the gradient is constant, then resistance would be constant as well. So in the stretch section, the resistance is not increasing. A is wrong. B is wrong. Between C and D, we have a correct answer there. Let's consider the curved section. As the current increases, we can see the graph is becoming more gentle. The gradient is decreasing. The gradient is becoming less and less. Now, coming to our formula here, 1 over gradient is actually becoming a bigger value. When gradient becomes small, 1 over gradient becomes large. So resistance is increasing on the curved section. So resistance increases. Our answer is D. Number 28 says, the diagram shows part of a circuit. What is the combined resistance of the resistors? All right. We start with these two resistors. They are in series, so their combined resistance is 3 ohms. Now, we consider this and this. They are in parallel. And to get the total resistance, we we'll say 1 over combined resistance is equal to 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. This gives us 7 over 12. 
which means combined resistance is equal to 12 over 7. Let's see what that gives us. It gives us 1.7. Our answer is C. Number 29 says, a diagram shows a circuit which includes two resistors and a battery. The voltmeter reads 6 volts. What is the potential difference across the 30 ohm resistor? All right. So if the voltmeter reads 6 volts, then we can figure out the current which is flowing through the 10 ohm resistor and therefore throughout the circuit. This will be current equal to V over R. That is 6 over 10, giving us 0 0.6 amperes. So this is the current which is flowing through the 10 ohm resistor and therefore through the 30 ohm resistor. Now, if we say V, we are now considering the 30 ohm resistor. V is equal to I R. We will get V being equal to 0 0.6 multiplied by 30. If we punch in our calculator, we get 18. So we select C. Number 30. A wire is moved down in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. Three changes are suggested. All right. Which change increases the electromotive force induced in the wire? When we increase the speed of movement of the wire, we are increasing what we call the rate of cutting of flux. Faraday noticed that such a change will lead to an increase in EMF. Changing the magnetic field strength so that it becomes weaker this is not going to improve the EMF produced. If we have a weak magnetic field, then we will have fewer or less flux to cut. So the EMF produced will be less. The direction of the magnetic field is reversed. This is not going to improve the EMF produced. So one is the only correct thing. 31 says, a wire is moved across a magnetic field. This causes an induced current in the wire. The induced current interact with the magnetic field to produce a force on the wire. In which direction is this force? A decode lens figured out that the force will oppose the motion which is creating the current. So it's not going to be in the direction of the current it's not going to be in the direction of movement of the wire. Otherwise, we may end up with the wire moving faster and faster and faster. And in generators, that would lead to creation of free energy. In the opposite direction to the current, that's not correct. In the opposite direction to the movement of the wire, this is our answer. That is the reason why if you have a generator that produces a lot of electric current, then 
for that generator to turn in this direction, you need a lot of force compared to a situation where you have a generator that produces a small current. The bigger force to turn the generator is required to overcome the effects of this force. Number 32 says, a 100% efficient step-down transformer has a primary voltage VP and a primary current IP. Which row compares the secondary voltage with VP and the secondary current with IP? If it is a step-down transformer, it will be taking a bigger VP or input voltage and making it smaller, stepping it down to a smaller VS, which is output voltage. So secondary voltage, which is the output voltage, must be less than input voltage, which is the primary. A and B are out. We are now looking at C and D. For a transformer that is 100%, the input power must be equal to the output power. So the input power would be, or well, let me use P primary, P secondary. So input power would be VP IP. Output power would be VS IS. If VP is bigger than Vs, then Is must be bigger than Ip. That is what will make this equation to balance. So secondary voltage is greater than Ip. Secondary current, sorry, is greater than primary current. Our answer would be C. Question number 33. The scattering of alpha particles by a thin metal foil supports the nuclear model of an atom. Why are alpha particles used rather than neutrons? We know that in the experiment, the positively charged alpha particles are deflected by the positive nucleus and it is the result of this deflection that we use to explain what is happening inside the atom so we need this positive and this positive to interact in order for the deflection to happen alpha particles are positive the nucleus is positive so, the positive charge is key here. Number 34 says, an ion nuclide is represented by the symbol shown. Which statement about the, about the nucleus of this ion nuclide are correct? The first one says, the nucleus contains 56 neutrons. Well, this number here is the nuclear number. It is the number of neutrons plus protons, not just neutrons alone. So this is out, and therefore this and this out. The nuclear number is 30. Well, like I just said, 56 is the nuclear number. The number of neutrons plus protons is 56. So 2 is out. So by elimination, D is the last one standing. 
and truly the proton number is 26 according to our interpretation of a, the nuclide notation we are looking at over there. Number 56 says, a sample of radioactive isotope has an initial rate of emission of 128 counts per minute and a half-life of four days. How long will it take for the rate of emission to fall to 32 counts per minute? So, we start with 128. After four days, which is one half-life, the emission rate is going to drop to half of 128 so 128 divided by 2 we are now at 64. half-life is the time required for the emission rate to drop to half its original value from 64 day 64 counts we need another four days for the count rate to drop to half of 64 would be 32. So in total, we need eight days. Number 36 says, several scientists are working in a laboratory. The scientists are experiment, experimenting with sources which emit ionizing radiation. Each scientist is given a list of circuit rules. Three of the rules are shown. Keep at least two meters away from other people. Do not stay longer than four hours per day in the lab. Stay behind the lead line screen. Which safety rules are for protection against the effects of ionizing radiation? Let's look at the rules. Two meters away from other people. Well, people are not emitting radiation so being further away from them maybe 10 meters two meters kilometers it's not really going to help so one is not really good which leaves us with this is out this is out this is out so it looks like the only option left standing let's see do not stay longer than four hours per day in the lab. That is a precaution against ionization. The longer you stay in an environment that has ionizing radiation, the more likely the effects of ionization are going to cause harm to you. So this is a valid safety rule. Stay behind the lead line screen. We know how good lead is when it comes to stopping radiation. So if you are behind the screen, you are safe from radiation. D is the correct answer here. 37 says, which data is needed to calculate the average orbital speed of a satellite around a planet? We know that the formula for average orbital speed is equal to 2 pi r divided by t. r here is the orbital radius, which is the distance between the center of the orbit and the actual orbiting satellite. So if it is a satellite and a planet, the center of the orbit will be at the center of the planet. And the actual orbiting satellite would be somewhere here. So this distance is our orbiting radius. T is the period, which is the time required to complete the orbit we call it the orbital period now let's look at the options given the distance of the satellite from the center of the planet well that is around the orbital radius 
So A, B, and D are correct. Still among the options to consider, C is already out. The radius of the planet. We do not really need the radius of the planet here. We just need the orbital radius, no need for the radius of the planet. So, okay, A is now out, B is still in. All right, so our answer here would be B. Let's see. The period of rotation of the planet. The rotation of the planet is not really important here. It is the period of rotation of the satellite that we need. So, we're good here, and we are good here. Number 38 says, Approximately how long does it take for the moon to make one complete orbit of the Earth? From the work that we have done, we know it's one month, approximately one month. Number 39. The energy generated in stable stars comes from nuclear reactions. Which type of reaction occurs in the sun? We know that in the sun, we have nuclear fusion. We have two smaller nuclei coming together to form a bigger nucleus, releasing energy in the process. What is being described in A, this is nuclear fission. A is not correct. Helium nuclei joining to give hydrogen does not make sense. Helium nuclei are bigger, so when they join, they will not give a smaller nuclei. They will give us an even bigger nucleus than themselves. So this is up. Hydrogen nuclei break up to give helium. We said fusion, so this is not correct. It's not breaking up, but coming together. Hydrogen nuclei join to form helium nuclei. This is correct. Two smaller nuclei coming together to form a bigger one and releasing energy. Number 40 says, two quantities define the Hubble constant H0. The speed at which the galaxy is moving away from the Earth, the distance of the galaxy from the Earth, what is the relationship between V and D, and what is the current estimate for the Hubble constant? We know that V is equal to H0 multiplied by D. We can say H0 is equal to V over D. Well, let's use this relationship. V is directly proportional to D because H0 is a constant. So we are looking at A and C. Now, the current estimate for H0 2.2 times 10 to the minus 18. So, A is our correct answer. Thank you guys. Please remember to subscribe for more content like this. Bye-bye.